session will be Sheila Murphy with a question. Okay. Um, I, first, I wanted to, to thank um, Dr. Flanagan for a very thought-provoking, um, I'm still kind of, you know, in my head thinking about all that he, he brought forth. But what about the women? How do women mm. fit into all this? What about the what? The women fit in. Good. That's it? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so you notice certain features, except for Morphine Mary, they were all men, my examples. And um, uh, they're all white. So uh, I'm aware of that. Uh, <laughs> so here's, here's roughly the idea. I think the... Um, the answer is that women are out there, but part of the sort of my aim behind this whole talk was to sensitize us actually following up on the, your talk and then Carl's talk, that the concept of addiction is not just an individual level phenomenon. Now, because I have substance abuse disorder, either now, depending on what you think it is, a permanent disease, or in my past, I'm actually pretty good at speaking from my own personal experience about what it was like to be the kind of um, Irish Catholic male, oldest kid uh, uh, in, a, in a large family, six children. Um, I can tell you about that. I can also tell you, read memoirs of uh, men who are like me or listen to them at uh, recovery meetings where I feel I really get it. I can, they can understand my experience and I can understand their experience. Um, but I think that this is what's, to me, in one way, the point. I don't feel that I have the position to speak from authority about what it's like um, to be um, uh, a woman addict. I've met plenty in my meetings over the years. I would just say this. Here's a sociological observation. Uh, more men come into meeting, alcoholic meetings having got into sort of public trouble. Jail, institutions, uh, police trouble. They were also, you know, uh, back when I did get sober, some people I saw there were people I used to drink with, but I didn't know they had a problem. We just all drank together. <laughs> there are more women who are likely to come in because of social stigmatization of female behavior in drinking, who you find out, as I said at lunch today, and I made the minister nervous, is the minister's wife, and she's 65 years old, and she's been drinking for a really long time. And it's been painful. So I, I partly, you know, my message today was really partly that the people who get permission to use in ways that we think of as abusive, Keith Richard maybe is the best example, tend to be white, rich, um, and uh, middle class or above men. And I think there's a different profile depending on the way they, a certain drug or substance runs through a community, uh, there are sort of sociological features of it. And so I intentionally decided not to speak for women. I don't have anything to say about, I, I spoke of what I know about like what it's like to be Keith Richard, I wish. <laughs> Such that, a problem that was to have, of, yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, very much. But I, I guess um, I, what I guess I wanted to take a moment to think about was <clears throat> in this notion of willing addiction, women are left out of that picture, and they're left out of that picture for very concrete um, and discernible reasons, one of which is childbearing, of course. Yeah. Um, and the uh, and the other one is our um, our uh, you know patriarchy, you know the fact that men get to do a lot of things that women don't get to do, uh, and get judged in a much harsher fa fashion, um, and therefore it becomes you know you know that that all seems unfair and unequal, but it also has real um, consequence for things like seeking treatment, um, uh, and if they want to, quitting using drugs. And, and I think they're doubly punished, du doubly stigmatized um, for their behaviors. Uh, and I think those are, these are important things to keep to the forefront when we're talking about these things. Mm -hmm. 
Carl Hart. Uh, thank you, Owen, for a really, um, a, a really good talk um, and helping us to think about some of the important issues. I, I just wonder if we could talk maybe further about two issues. I mean, the panel. I know it's a difficult situation in which you, are, you find yourself right now because you just gave a talk a long ass talk, uh, and, and now it was you, shorter than yours. Really? Yeah. But, <laughs> but who's counting? <laughs> but but now, <laughs> now but now you you're asked to like pay attention and answer these questions from all of us. So I know that's difficult. So I want to maybe ask others to help out. You know, but thank you for raising um, these uh, important issues. Two issues that you raised that I think need some more um, clarification, some more discussion, deals with the issue of uh, addiction as a brain disease. Uh, and the issue of just the terminology, particularly when I think about morphine, Mary. Uh, addiction, uh, as defined by the DSM, of course the, the word isn't used and we think about clinicians. The main thing is that people are distressed and you have these social dysfunctions, disruptions, not physical dependence. The field moved away from that many years ago. Uh, so physical dependence is not even that important. We all know that, um, uh, at least in the field. And so I wonder if we could talk more about that and the issue of brain disease. Uh, it's kind of simple when we ask people, <laughs> Can you show me in the brain where is addiction? Can you show me how addiction is a brain disease like other brain diseases? Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, brain diseases. What evidence do we have that drug addiction is a brain disease? Can, can, can I speak to that one? That's, that's a topic that's close to my heart. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, and Mark, I'm just going to ask to make sure you speak up clearly. Okay, I'm going to speak as loud as I can. Um, you know, my whole my talk tonight is going to be about whether addiction is a brain disease, and the answer is no. So that's so you don't have to come to my talk. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> but uh, although, and I agree with you, Carl, that uh, you know that you can't point to an area, and there's no. Okay, let, let, me, let, me, let me say this. Um, Owen, the one thing you said that I disagreed with is that you said addiction is not a natural kind. Now, it's not what I'm saying. Not a natural kind. And, uh, I, I, I said natural? That? Not natural. I not said Owen. it. Owen did. Oh, Owen said it. Oh, oh, not, not you. Okay. Well, Owen, I'm going to get back to you. Uh, that addiction is not a natural kind, you said. And a natural kind, for, for non-philosophers, I guess, is means... Uh, something that is like definable as a unitary, separate, uh, independent thing, like a zebra. A zebra is a zebra, okay, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, and there's no, there's no different ways to be a zebra. You're either a zebra or you're not. Um, so, but I think addiction is a natural kind, but I don't think it's a brain disease. So that's where I want to draw a line. Normally when we think it's a natural kind, aha, it's a disease. No, it's not a disease. But it's a very specific phenomenon that's got really specific uh, 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 characteristics to it, and such as it's self-perpetuating, it's self-building, it feeds on itself, um, you know, and all, there's, there's a number of different things. I think of it as an attractor in a state space, which some of you might know what that kind of language means, but I mean, it's, it's a place that people often end up in because different paths lead to it, like different paths lead to Rome, and then you're there. And then it's very distinct. And you know, like people say about an orgasm, you, you, there's no question about whether you've had one or not. <laughs> you know if you had an orgasm. What if you're faking it? <laughs> <laughs> you I think know. that's a good oh, time hold, for me hold, to hold jump on. in here. So, well, so, hold just, on, because I... <laughs> I, just I think if there's a question to, yeah. to Owen here uh, about the uh, natural yeah. kind, what we mean so by let me, that. So let me, well, can I, why don't I just finish? finish. Give me, give yeah, and then let's... Sentences and then I will stop. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So I think it is a very specific phenomenon, but it's not a disease. So that's why it's difficult. That's why it's confusing. That's why we have such a hard time. That's why we continue to argue whether it's a disease or not. is because it is a natural kind. It's a very specific thing. But it's not a disease. I'm just going to leave it there. But you think it takes also, place? Hold on, hold on. We're, let's give okay, yeah, a chance ahead. to respond to what I took to be the question to so, him. So, 
yeah, this is where I think, uh, so three, three points, uh, helpful. So you heard that I, I claim that it can't possibly be a brain disease for reasons that Carl just indicated. No one's able, uh, with lots of work, to show uh, the distinctive brain profile. But even if they were, if you think about the logic, the sort of social logic of the way we describe whether someone's an addict or not, it depends on all kinds of features independent of the person's brain and even body. And that's why I think what Carl, I, I'm not sure if Carl and I, Carl might have think he disagrees with me about Morphine Mary. The reason I like Morphine Mary is if there was, suppose, a, a squiggle squaggle that every morphine, heavy morphine user's brain did, then Morphine Mary would show up that way. But the reason no one is going to attribute to her the normative uh, scar of being an addict is because she's not out on the street scoring street drugs and causing trouble or potentially causing trouble. So she gets permissions because of features that have nothing to do with her or her use. But um, the, as, I, as I tried to say yesterday, I think some of us know here who hang around in the addiction talk circuit that there are a lot of people who just want to say it is a brain disease. The simple solution is just to say uh, um, addictive use or abusing drugs involves features of the brain that might be one location of intervention for different drugs with different other drugs, perhaps, or different kinds of therapy. It's just as an aspect, just as the, the normative and political structures of society which say this is a really bad drug and so there's black drug fiends on the streets in 1914 or whatever it was in the South. Um, uh, or the cocaine. I remember the year in which I read, um, in the, it must have been about 1981, I was still in the Northeast, that crack cocaine was an epidemic and no one in the history of the universe who ever uh, used crack had ever recovered from crack addiction. And uh, that was the rhetoric that was out there. The, with regard to the, the quick other point about natural kinds, um, uh, the way philosophers of science would usually use natural kinds, it would apply, as Mark said, to like when you go into a, a chemistry room and you see the periodic table of elements. You know, uh, gold is a substance with atomic number 79. That's a natural kind. And some people say zebra is a natural kind. I pretty much think that social kinds are never natural kinds, because we sometimes say a natural kind is a kind that carves nature at its joints. And I think that any kind, like something like addiction, substance abuse, all these things have so many political, cultural, gender-related, um, uh, how the society is viewing them, treating them, uh, which are so politicized and economically and in every other way that you're not carving nature at any joint that I know about. Um, that's all. Uh, Mark Willenbring was yep. next. I, a couple things. First of all, <clears throat> in some ways it doesn't matter whether we call it a disease. Uh, it, you know, in, in terms of <clears throat> where, where to intervene is really the, 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 the question, and that's on multiple levels. I mean, the reason tuberculosis uh, is no longer highly prevalent, has had very little to do with antibiotics, had almost everything to do with, pu with public health measures yeah. to get better water and sewage. So, uh, and, and taxation is a way to reduce alcohol use, for example. Um, so, one of the things I wanted to do, well, first of all, I'd just like to offer, in, to try to, I mean, the, the issue of whether, whether something is a disease is fundamentally, to, in my mind, definitional. And that's a lengthy and complex discussion. I guess I'd just like to offer one conceptualization I have of it, uh, which is from George Kube, who's the head of the Alcohol Institute George. at NIH, um, where uh, some, a system that's in homeostasis shifts into a different stable configuration called allostasis that's less adaptive. And whatever levels of the system you're talking about, everything from social to, as uh, Ken Kendler says, you know, if we want to get really reductionistic, it's all about particle physics. But uh, I think one of the key aspects is, so there's two things about this. Fundamentally, I think that we, it's often about uh, a biological reductionism to say it's just a brain disease. Mm. And I believe it was Stephen Jay Gould who said, who wrote that, Biological reductionism, politically, is always reactionary. 
because you blame an individual right. for their problems that may well have been caused because of social uh, policies and, and, and other things like that, uh, family situations and so forth. So, and, and, but I wanted to, to kind of circle back then uh, to one of the very first things you said, Alan, which was at the very beginning is that, and it took me 40 years as a clinician and a researcher to finally get it, that there's only one thing happening. There's only one, it's not, we, we, we have so much trouble getting away from linear, oh, it's ca this causes this and then that causes that, whereas in fact the whole system is just constantly interacting. We are complex dynamical systems and it's very hard to model that. But it's only one thing happening at once and they're just different uh, levels of analysis. I, yes, thank you. I, I think this is a very rich discussion, and I agree with my colleagues we could go on and on and on, but I'd like to bring us to the other part of it. As a humanist, first and foremost in this work, I follow the adage, and forgive the word disease, replace it with condition or whatever you want. Don't ask what disease the person has. Ask what person the disease has. Let's talk about the person who needs our help, because we all know someone who has the condition, the disease, the biopsychosocial disorder, and I'd like to bring us there, because we know that how we interact with people with whatever level of issue they report affects whether they're willing, resigned, motivated, or not. So I, I think I'd like to move us in that direction. How do we talk with these folks to help them find what they need. Okay. Well, I, I work at an outpatient program. It's innovative, um, unlike any I've ever seen. And we almost never have this conversation. It almost never comes up because it's irrelevant to whether or not they get well. So I agree right. with Michael. Right. Her. I'd like to ask a question from a student. He asks, many people that I look look up to and would consider to be role models fall into the category of willing addict. Do you think this is either positive or negative or neither? And he signs it a white male artist slash student. Well, I, I would first say let's not assume that they're a willing addict. Let's figure out what that is. I mean, that, that was very useful in terms of the talk, but it's not something that really uh, in, in any empirical way defines the person. Uh, if that per I wouldn't even call that person an addict. I don't use the word addict, alcoholic, clean, or dirty. I use these more disease-like terms because they take it away from the person. It, they're not pejorative. So don't assume they're a willing addict. There's some issue. Do they want some help? Ask them if they want some help, why they might want some help. So the, the more labeling we do, even if we feel empirically accurate, I think the more difficult it is to motivate people to change. Just a quick uh, um, response to it. That's a very moving question that the student asks. And uh, um, just, I think it's tricky. Uh, I, I think actually the class of people that I was willing to, trying to ask us to think about who might Fit, might fit the profile of people who are okay with their addiction because I think it's important to like realize that this is a really complicated spectral phenomenon or set of phenomena. But I was thinking of people who, like a Keith Richard, would just say with impunity, "I do this. The people who love me are fine with it, and I'm just going to do." This. I do this, yeah, and I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it, right? right. Certainly don't meet criteria for addiction. No, There's right. no social disruptions, yeah, no exactly. disruptions, no distress. Right, right. 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 But so, I mean, there are people here tonight who will go out and drink their alcohol in right. their usual ways. Right, that's right. Just one clarification. Well, just one. Let oh, me just sorry. say that, that quick. But I thought the very moving question is, you know, one never knows, and it goes back to some things that were said earlier about, that we've all been trying to say, I think, about the complex system level. One might be looking up to adults that one thinks have a problem, as opposed to someone who, people who are fine with whatever. And that, and there are lots of family rules. On, on this Sunday night on 60 Minutes, Patrick Kennedy, Ted Kennedy's son, spoke about a 1993 intervention with his dad about his, his dad, Senator Kennedy's drinking, and he reported that his father opened the door and went out and wrote his son a mail letter saying, don't ever do that again. 
and they never talked about it again. So these things are very, very complicated, situation specific. I don't think there's any general algorithm for knowing what you're dealing with exactly or what the system uh, is like. It's very complicated and individual. I would uh, caution us to be very careful if we're listening to Patrick Kennedy about anything related to this issue. I, Mark I, Willenbring, you were, you were on your way to I say just, something. I just, I just, uh, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, just a quick clarification okay. is that in terms of the diagnosis, it requires clinically significant impairment or distress. So if somebody is using and they're neither distressed yeah. nor impaired, then they don't have a disorder. Not disorder. Yeah. All right. Mark Lewis. Mine's quick, too. I just want to say that zebra, even though it's a natural kind, a zebra is very complex. <laughs> <laughs> One more, I mean, so addiction can be a certain thing and still have many levels to it. And yes, I think a lot of them you, I can point to in the brain, but that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of very also important levels going on in the social realm. That's, that's all. Yep. Uh, and just a, a comment about the Kennedy interview. I started out kind of with that reaction. It's like, oh, here we go, the old party line. But I will say that one thing that I felt that he did in the interview by coming public, coming forward um, in such a prominent way, breaking the family rules and the taboo, is that so many families who live with this um, have tremendous shame. And um, I think that he helped to kind of break some of the rules about that and help some of those of us who have struggled with that feel better about, you know, we, we should be able to talk about this publicly just the way we do about a family member with cancer or diabetes. And I like that part of it. Thank you, Anne. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I have, I have, hold on, Sheila, I, I just have starting. to say something, you, you know, Anne's point is well taken. It's, it's just that I've heard Patrick Kennedy say so many inane things <laughs> on this subject that I'm biased. <laughs> Well, and what I was just going to say is, you know, I think that some people in the audience are saying, well, what the hell are they talking about? Who, you know, it's a brain disease. It's not a brain disease. Who cares? You know, if I have somebody in my life who's losing their job, yep. you know, wetting the bed, doing whatever it is that's, that's, that's disrupting my family life, what, you know, what do we care if it's a disease or not? But it has real importance how we conceptualize. Yep. Yes. It has importance to, for us as scientists as to what kind of questions we can address. It has real importance for the person who is thinking about themselves and their drug use and saying, well, if I have a disease, uh, I haven't heard of any drugs that are going to cure this disease, and drugs are my problem. Maybe I should be a resigned person. I mean, what, what should I try? I've already ruined my brain. And what we're saying is, no, nah, no, okay. That's, and, and, I, and I think we have to think about that. That's why this discussion is important, because the way we, as people who are trying to understand addiction, treat addiction, live with, not addiction is the wrong word, drug, drug use and, or drug abuse, um, is, is, has real import and real consequence. Yeah. Mike? No, good points. Excellent. Uh, people can recover. You know, we haven't said that here. People can recover. They can yeah, yeah. get better. They often and if do. we bring in That's Dr. Candell's work here in plasticity, the brain can rebound. Whether it came from the brain or not, it certainly affects the brain. We all know that. And so it can rebound. People can get well. I just wanted to make a point that, about what we talked about before. Uh, with Patrick Kennedy, you can come out and talk to your family members that you're concerned about. I think that's a good part of that. I want to, though, stress the message that traditional interventions and that approach to dealing with your loved ones does not work. So that's not the way to talk to them. And later on this afternoon, we'll learn more ways of doing that. Right. Final comment sure. from Mark Lewis, and then we'll adjourn. But we'll be back here at 3 o'clock with the panel discussion about uh, we it, do. Okay, not, not only people can recover, they most often recover. Right. And, you know, the, I mean, you hear stats between 60 and 75 percent do recover yep. from, Without like, real, from real addiction. Without any treatment. And, and a lot of those, a lot of those, yeah, recover not. without treatment. Like the majority 
You know, people are not aware of that, and it's really important. Doesn't mean they have to do it that way. It's a no, very painful no, way. No, some people need treatment. Yep. Uh, uh, for some people, it's very yeah. beneficial, but some people don't. Uh, right. A lot of people don't. So it's just important to, uh, to mention that. You know, and the funny thing about the brain disease issue, which I will come back to in my talk, is, is uh, and I really uh, ag uh, agree with what, with what you just said, that um, it really matters. The first, the first article that said, that came up with the brain disease official designation said, addiction is a brain disease and it matters. That was the title of the article and that was in the 90s. And 1997 and it wasn't an article, it was an opinion piece. That's right, in, the, in science, right? That's right, it was an opinion piece by Alan, Alan Lester. Lester. Okay, but that's like a short article. But anyway, and then recently a couple of pieces have come out saying, Addiction is not a brain disease, and it matters. <laughs> like, those are the title. And, and yeah, because it, it does matters. matter. It matters because it, it really helps, helps us with our thinking, helps and us know I what. would really encourage anyone who thinks it's a brain disease to read Alan Lesner's 1997 science paper and evaluate it for evidence, evaluate it for rigor. It won't hold up. I disagree. Well, you haven't read it, or you well, don't know no, what you're you know, reading. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm not defending the paper, but but I I, I think that. Uh, but I know we have to stop. <laughs> but we will be back at three o'clock. At which point we Please will have back. Mark Willenbrink, Mike Panalone, and Ann Fletcher, and then they'll all be joined by the merry band again. So back here at three. Gonna Thank you. Wonderful paper by Owen Flanagan. Yeah. Thank you. Do we uh, <laughs> Ann Fletcher, Mark Lewis, and Carl Hart will be available for book signing in the forum. Um, unfortunately, we're sold out of Dr. Hart's book, but there are a hundred some copies floating out there that I think some people would like to have signed. Otherwise, Ann's book and Mark's book will be available for purchase over in the forum.